Welcome to the 94.7 FM, The Word Book Club. I'm Tom Muller. My guest is Kathy Cook. Uh, she's a PhD. I was just uh, saying that you are the uh, author of Parent Differently. Uh, I just also mentioned, obviously, that uh, if you listen to Kath to uh, focus on the family periodically, you hear Kathy. I was asking your permission. Do I call you Dr. Kathy? Do I call you Dr. Cook? Do I call you Kathy? And well, I, I go by Dr. Up. Kathy. I go by Dr. Kathy professionally, but I think that we would be friends. So Kathy's fine. <laughs> okay. That, that clears that up. Yeah. That, that's good. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate very much uh, for you to, to be with us. Uh, and we want to talk about your book, Parent Differently. Let me ask you a question uh, that uh, that I need to do it from the very beginning. Let me ask you a question. Is this too simple, too simplistic for me to say that your book is about helping kids develop character? Right. I mean, that's my goal is that parents and grandparents, educators, pastors would read it. And they would learn something of value so that they can teach biblical character. A lot of children tell me that they're told what to do and yelled at when they don't do it. And they would like to be taught how to do it. Uh -huh. So I think I make a strong case for biblical character, for why it's valuable, and then how to make sure that our kids have a chance to become uh, people who carry Christ well, if you will, and represent him well because of their character. Um, the reason why I bring that up. Uh, and we'll get into the uh, biblical character aspects and the various uh, things that you just said. But the the, the uh, title of the book intrigues me, Parent Differently, which seems to imply that a lot of us have gone about the wrong way to try to develop character. Am I wrong on that? No, you're, you're not wrong, sir. You know, I, I wrote the book because I saw it you know, a kind of a deficit in culture. I think a lot of parents are doing very, very well. A lot of parents want to do well by their children. A lot of parents are working hard to be intentional. What I want is for that intentionality to carry through. I want parents to not go with the flow of the culture. I want them to be different. If you're a Christ follower, there it ought to show up in the choices we make and in the behaviors we exhibit and in the goals that we have for our kids. So I'm hoping that there's inspiration within the pages of the book that are going to help. Yeah. Well, I, that makes me feel a little better that that uh, I can, whenever I meet somebody like you, talk to somebody like you, introduce somebody like you on the radio, or, or in this case, the video, uh, my kids are grown. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, golly, I wish I knew this back then, you know. And uh, I just have this parade of mistakes that I've made <laughs> up, <laughs> up until... But one thing that I'm very glad is that I talk to people like you that we can speak to parents whose kids are younger and and uh, maybe they can jump in front of the parade and uh, do things differently. Absolutely, Tom. And I think that I'm going to go on record to say it's also never too late. I think that grown children, teenagers, young adults are still looking at parents. When my parents were alive, I still paid attention to who they were being and what they said. And I think especially if you have a guinea pig kid, you know, the, the oldest child who was your experimental kid, you know, you, you could read a book like this and you could go to a child and say, you know, we did the best that we knew how to do at the time. And I hope that you know that, you know, we love you and we, we keep learning. You know, we care about our grandkids. We still care about our lives and about you and we keep learning. And, you know, we, we want to, you know, apologize for this. We want to make some changes here. I don't think it's ever too late. I was, by the way, the guinea pig kid in my family. So, <laughs> so maybe maybe I can point to myself and say, hey, not my fault, not my fault. <laughs> yeah, we, we could or not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's true, right? We have responsibility. We take personal responsibility for what is ours. And we um, acknowledge maybe where there were mistakes made or where there were strengths in our parenting. And we respond with gratitude, with forgiveness, whatever would be appropriate. Uh, you you cite uh, the fact that character is a conglomeration of uh, mm -hmm. of various qualities, uh, attributes that come into a 
a child's life. Um, and so uh, talk to us about the components of character and the various uh, attributes that really form a core of the how-to of your book. Right. So there's 48 qualities that I recommend in the book. There's more than that. But because I believe they're connected, I didn't want to overwhelm people, so I stuck with 48. There's a baker's dozen 13 that I think are the primary core that we should really train up in our children and really exhibit in our own lives. And I want our, our kids to have a, um, a complete character, as many of those qualities as possible, consistently use the qualities, meaning that I'm generous when I have a lot and when I have a little. I'm kind to both family members and strangers, so am I consistently able to use the quality and then the third thing I look for in kids is, are they able to automatically use the quality? Like, wouldn't it be a dream to be able to not keep you know, reminding our kids, be patient, remember to be kind. It, there, there needs to be a place where our kids develop the heart for Christ likeness and want to exhibit the qualities on their own. So consistent, automatic, and complete are three things to consider. And then if you want, we can look at some of the qualities that I think are most important. Yeah, I'd like to. I, I, I really would. So consistent, uh, say those three again. Yeah, I want kids to have a complete character. Mm -hmm. I want them to consistently use the character and I want them to automatically use it so that they're good even when we're not there. Right, Tom? Yeah. They're able to be well and do well even when no one's looking, even when we're not there reminding them to be confident or to be resilient or to be brave. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can see how that's an overview uh, uh, overviews all of the other qualities that you you identify. Uh, and it presupposes, it seems to me, uh, as you said at the beginning of our interview, it presupposes a biblical lifestyle, a biblical understanding, a growing biblical understanding, um, and a, a biblical display of character by the parents. Yes. Here it's, you know, this... I've had many people read the book already, Tom, and reach out to say, wow, this was about me. And I appreciate that. I think we're, if you're a Christ follower, you know, we're, we're called to become more like Christ and to exhibit God. I, I want biblical character so that God is glorified. I don't want people to develop a biblical character so that they feel better about themselves or look good to others. I want it to be about putting God on display and his, his strength and his wisdom, his love and his righteousness. I think biblical character means that we... Um, examine the Old and New Testament. You know, the Proverbs is in the Old Testament. The Proverbs, oh my goodness, every verse is relevant. You're either a fool or a wise one, according to Proverbs. And then there's biblical characters, right? There's biblical heroes. There's Esther and Daniel and David and Paul and Naomi and Ruth. And, you know, there's so many that we can become more like. There's the one and others of the New Testament. Love one another, submit to one another, greet one another with the holy kiss. There's lo the love of 1 Corinthians 13. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There are so many things in the Scripture that we can um, attain because God is good and we can uh, strive for. And then it's just easier, right? If you follow God's ways and God's will in your belief system and in your behavior, it's just easier to live life in this crazy culture. And that's what I hope people discover. As you're talking about this, you're talking about... Uh completeness, uh, a growing into completeness. I think of the Apostle Paul saying, yeah. I'm not arrived yet. And yet yeah. you look at him and you go, he hasn't arrived yet, you know. Uh, uh, so there is a, a growing in completeness. But the, the other side of the coin, I think, is what I have called a cliche Christian. A, a Christian that kind of moves through life in cliches uh, without a whole lot of depth, uh, somehow thinking that he's either evangelizing effectively or he's either uh, raising his family effectively. And yet really there's a, a thin layer of Christianity that is real more cliche. Um, what you're suggesting really is far deeper than just what a cliche Christian presents. Yes, I love that you brought that up. I, I appreciate the term cliche Christian. I sometimes talk about the fire insurance Christian, the, 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 the truly saved person, the person who made a commitment to Christ, who recognizes 
the sin nature wants to be saved from that and, and live eternally with Jesus. You know, we all live eternally somewhere. So, however, a fire insurance Christian is someone who has not been discipled. And sadly, there's a lot of that going on. There are a lot of churches that I'm afraid have not stepped up to the plate to really take people from what I would call, you know, milk and bread to prime rib and a loaded baked potato, one of my favorite meals, you know. So have we done a good job within the body of the church, within our families? Have moms and dads, you know, taken the time and sacrificed their wants to sit down with their kids and explain that this is being more like Jesus? Here's an example of where you could have stepped up and been more like Christ so that we become um, examples of Jesus, right? And that's lordship. And it took me a long time. I don't know about you, Tom, but I was saved a pretty long time before Jesus really got a hold of me and the lordship of Christ began to um, transform my heart, my mind, and my spirit to the things of God. And I'm disappointed in that. And yet so grateful now, of course, that I, I know the whole of why God sent his son, Jesus. It wasn't just to save us. Yeah. Um, eternal life starts now. Heaven come down. And that's only going to happen when we live in our maturity that is possible through Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you also speak about uh, the importance of uh, mom and dad living, modeling in front of uh, their their kids. And uh, I imagine that that also includes speaking to their kids when they don't live up to the model. Yes, and speaking correctly. So in a lot of my books, I teach about how to compliment and correct, not to shame children, not to just judge children, but to walk with them, to lead by example, and then to walk alongside and say, you know, Jeremiah, Here's an example where you could have been kinder. Let me tell you what I noticed. So being really observant, Tom, and being intentional with that, looking for what is good and talking about strengths, because we can't overcome weakness without knowing our strengths. And then when we walk with our kids and say, you know, I'm, I'm just confused. Why, why were you stingy and not generous when generosity is a quality that our family aspires to? Um, why was it difficult for you to be patient with your sister? You know, normally when you teach your sister a new game, you're you're patient, you you delight when she's happy. And I noticed today, man, I was able to hear what was going on and you were quickly critical and she left the room. And so that's on you. You know, what was wrong in you that would cause you to behave that way towards your sister? So I think having conversations is key. And one of the recommendations I would make, Tom, is that the family work on something. It is about mom and dad. And, you know, we would all be better people if we understood how many people are watching us and how many people would aspire maybe to become like us. That's a kind of a frightening thought, but I think it's the real way that humans work. But as an example, let's say your whole family wants to become more joyful. Joy is number two on my list, a really important quality to live out in our lives. And what if you recognize that happiness was a goal that your family aspired to? And happiness is cheap. Happiness is happenings. It's circumstantial. It's not guaranteed, but joy is in Jesus. So what if you had a conversation, dad leads, ideally, and the whole family commits to living out joy, one with another and out and about. And so for a week or for 10 days, you talk about joy, you look at joy verses, you talk about Jesus and his joy. You ask the kids when they come home from co-op or school or piano lesson, hey, in what way did you exhibit joy today? And the whole family works on it. So, you know, Sarah Beth gets to ask mom, hey, mom, when you were at the grocery store, did you exhibit joy? And the mom gets to talk about, well, actually, not so much, you know. And so if the family, the kids really benefit from understanding that parents are still growing in these attributes. Uh, as you say, when you were at the grocery store, speaking as a man, when you're in any store, did you exhibit joy? <laughs> and I would have to say, no. No. <laughs> uh, which brings me to, again, uh, parental modeling. Uh and and being honest, when you fall short of whatever uh, specific thing that you are uh, engaged in, that you should be modeling. Tell us about right. And, that. You know, one of the most important things to model is the consequences of our choices. So uh, a true example, somebody who read my book, um, a, a dad was at work and um, a supervisor knocked on his door at about three o'clock and said, hey, where's the report? It was due at two. And this dad, this gentleman, realized that he had chosen to do what he wanted to do rather than what he was supposed to do. Forgot about the report. He was embarrassed. He had to apologize. And he got he gets home from, from work and his kids are, you know, how was school? And then they're like, oh, how was work? And the dad chose to be honest. And he said, hey, I did what you guys sometimes do. I forgot about something that was due. 
I chose to do what was easier and, and more, you know, entertaining to me. And boy, I disappointed my boss. And now I'm going to have to earn back trust. He may not ask me at the next staff meeting to take on a project because he's concerned that I may not follow through. It was not a good day. And I have now calendared every Tuesday at two that my report is due. And I've made a note on Monday at two that says, remember tomorrow at two. And so I, you know, I'm going to have to, and by the way, you know, Brian, I can't come to your soccer game tonight. I've got to stay home and get this thing done. And I'm so sorry. So I think we explain what happens when we make mistakes. And you also have consequences when life goes well, and you can share those also. You also, uh, in the book, as you can tell, I read the book. Uh, I appreciate that so much. <laughs> uh, you also, in the book, uh, talk about uh, parental priorities. I, I can think of, it doesn't matter what stage in life uh, your kids are, they're a handful. And the more kids, the more of a multiplication of the handful. Uh, and uh, you have to do priorities. Uh, but sometimes character development in with the kind of depth you're talking about is left behind. It, 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 uh, as you point out, parents want to instill these qualities in their kids. But but it's kind of like a hand-picked thing, you know, here, toss you this, toss you that. Now let's go, you know, uh, to the store or whatever. Um, you got to prioritize this. It, it seems to me that uh, from the get-go in marriage, you, you, you start with two people and you're prioritizing your relationship. But when the kids come along, you got to put in that mix a uh, pretty high priority. Uh, at the very beginning and tracing the priority through the life of your kids, no matter what their age is. I, I love that perspective. It's, and I want to say, and I'm sure you would agree, Tom, like I respect that it's challenging today. Moms and dads are busy. Um, these are not easy days. Um, there are children who have gone astray and it can be really um, difficult and stressful and challenging. Um, I think if you have kids, prioritize kids, uh, and I don't say that lightly. And one of the th one of the points I make often, and and I and I just I'm just going to say it: we skill and drill the one two threes, and we skill and drill the ABCs, and we state a rule and expect compliance. And that's just not fair and not realistic. I get it. We want kids to wake up one day and boom, they're they're beautiful people and always obedient. But because of the sin nature. Um, obedience and character are more difficult to attain than the ABCs and the one, two, threes. So a parent who reads a book like mine and chooses to hunker down and teach gratitude and teach joy and teach resiliency and teach courage is going to find great benefits of that for themselves and for their kids and then ultimately for their family unit. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It doesn't mean you're a bad parent if you have to teach character. It means you're a really good parent that you want to teach character. You had mentioned uh, getting into some of the other qualities uh, that all make up uh, character. Let's uh, uh, let's talk about the qualities that you've identified in your book. Yeah, I appreciate that. I start with gratitude. Gratitude is a parent virtue. There's biblical research and other kinds of research that would suggest that um, grateful people um, rule the world. Grateful people um, have many other qualities that come alongside of that. Generosity, goodness, kindness, patience, other-centeredness, joy, um, gratitude. Not forced thank you notes, but people who are truly in their spirit grateful. And if you're a believer, um, you know there's so much to be grateful for. So I would pray that it would rule our world. And that's followed by joy. Again, not circumstantial happiness, but a true, deeply rooted joy. When we work, When we walk through our lives grateful and joyful, it changes us and it changes the culture because we stand out as different. By the way, those those traits, Tom, are they're like siblings or even a married couple. They're, they come right alongside of each other. Grateful people tend to be joyful. Joyful people tend to be grateful. They're also the first and the second ones because technology robs children of both of those. Technology allows children to prioritize happiness and uh, technology causes almost all of us to become more entitled. We think we deserve what we want when we want it, but that's not biblical, but gratitude is. The third quality that I prioritize is self-efficacy. That's a phrase not everyone knows. That's okay. Self-efficacy simply means that I can be effective. So if, for instance, 
if you don't teach your son how to empty the dishwasher and you say, hey, it's your turn to empty the dishwasher, he's going to panic. He doesn't want to disappoint mom. He doesn't want to break a bowl. He doesn't remember where the coffee cups go. So he's overwhelmed. So he throws a fit. He resists. He says, I don't want to. But when you teach a child how to empty a dishwasher or how to change his clothes at bedtime or how to help his sister get ready for bed, when you teach a child how to be successful, then they have what's called self-efficacy and they battle less. They're more willing to be agreeable. It isn't agreeable a beautiful quality. So those are the first three, gratitude, joy, and self-efficacy. You also uh, are very honest in the book about uh, uh, some various situations that uh, you you have confronted uh, where, where you were aware instantly that what was going on inside of you was not what you're preaching uh, and dealing with it. Appreciate that honesty. Well, thanks for saying that. I think self-awareness is key, right? And I, I think for the reader, you know, again, it is a book for parents, yet I would want us to own it for ourselves. And that means that we have to know who we could be versus who we are being. And then we decide to turn around and repent and walk toward um, righteousness. Uh, you, this is really a how-to book. It's a great information, a lot of information, um, and that's good. But it's also a how-to book, uh, how to access the information, how to deal with it in your own uh, life and your own involvement with your children. Uh, give us some strategies that you put in the book. Oh, thanks. Wow. Um one of the points I make is that children benefit from knowing the negative quality and the positive quality. So, you know, rather than, um, man, you're so impatient, you're so impatient, talk more about patience. So talk about who you want them to be, not who they currently are. I think that's a good strategy. Um, I, I make the point that um, negative behavior is rooted in negative character. So rather than stop arguing, stop arguing, stop arguing, which how many of us have said that? That's very common today. What if we said instead, start doing this? So arguing, as an example, is a lack of submission. Arguing is almost always a selfish self-centeredness. Arguing is almost always a lack of flexibility, meaning that I, I can't do what mom says because I had this plan, I'm going to do this. So what if we saw the negative behavior that bothers us in terms of negative character and started teaching the opposite character, flexibility, submission, other-centeredness, et cetera. I think that's a very important point I make in the book. I do talk about, um, well, again, looking at Bible heroes, um, studying scripture, studying um, Jesus himself, who's an example of all the character that we would ever want in our lives. So looking at your family devotions, maybe through a different light, and making it um, practical in that way, which I think would encourage kids. And hence, as you talk about that, that really illustrates the various kinds of qualities that all come to bear on character, on whether you have it or whether you don't. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, it's a resource. You know, it's not a check off these boxes. Here's the how-to. This is a resource that parents can go to and and go to again and again and again. I appreciate, I appreciate you recognizing that. I do hope that it's not a book that they're going to loan out. I hope it's a book they'll keep. Um, I hope that they bookmark the appendix that has the list of 48. I hope they actually read some of it out loud to their kids and say, mm -hmm. you know, look what an expert says. You know, we're capable of this as a family. Let's get better at this. Now, I, I also want to talk about your ministry because I know that uh, uh, it's important for the audience to understand you kind of where you're coming from in terms of uh, uh, the, the ministry, Celebrate Kids. Tell us about Celebrate Kids. Oh, thank you so much, Tom. Well, it's named after the fact that that's what Jesus did. Jesus celebrated kids even when others in the culture were not. And I want to... I embrace that concept and help parents, grandparents, educators, and others um, celebrate kids like Jesus did, looking for the positive, calling out the negative, only when you're going to instruct them to change. 
Um, we are uh, making a difference through uh, podcasting, radio interviews. Um, we have our own podcast. I love being a guest on shows like yours. I'm an author of seven books with Moody and I'm a public speaker. So basically I get paid to talk. So I'm hired by uh, different uh, churches, schools and organizations to speak. And I get to speak to kids, teens, young adults, parents, grandparents, singles, women. It's just, I'm so amazed. I was a chatty Cathy as a kid and uh, now people pay me to talk. And I tell kids that all the time. I, I don't do what I do to get the money. You know, obviously it's not about money. It's about ministry. And yet um, I want to encourage kids to believe that they too can grow up one day and be agents of change to the glory of God when they become who God intended for them to be. I'm very much a um, created to be person, meaning that Jesus, God, God was intentional when he made us us. Um, I'm not too tall. I'm tall. It's a difference. If you say you're too tall, you are dismissing God's creative intent. And we have got to teach children today that God was good when he made them who he made them to be. And we need to help them grow into that reality and not reject themselves. Those are part, some of our passions. I could talk all day. And I appreciate you asking. Our website is CelebrateKids.com. So CelebrateKids.com, you can find our podcast there and other information. And, and we, like everyone else in the world, we are on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Okay. And as you said that uh, you... Uh, uh, you talk, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You you talk. I uh, I had uh, uh, a speaking engagement at at one point where I I came clean that I have one gift in life and that's I can talk. <laughs> there, there's no other gift <laughs> that I that I have other than the fact that I talk. If you want to listen to me, well, uh, you got my gift. Uh, if you want anything else. How to fix cars? How to? My wife was in the hospital for uh, some cancer surgery. She uh -huh. left a big long list on the refrigerator, things to do. At the top of the list, she says, "Tom, turn around and look." I turned around, look, look back at what she wrote. She says, "That is called a dishwasher." <laughs> <laughs> So, I love uh, it. I, I'm sure that you're far more gifted in a lot of different ways, including I know you're an acknowledged expert on kids. So, mm -hmm. uh, I really recommend parent differently, raise kids with biblical character that changes culture. And I guess you would say changes culture one kid at a time. Right. And I want kids to know that they can change culture. Um, when their character is is right, because we, we don't want them to have to wait to grow up because it might be too late. Let's give them purpose now. Yeah. Absolutely. Really appreciate being on the show with you. Well, I appreciate talking to you a lot. Is there anything that I missed or that you want to add or you want to underscore? Oh, man, you covered a lot. Um, I hope people hear hope in our interview. It's never too late. Um, and especially, you know, if you're new to the faith or you know, you weren't raised well. I mean, whatever your story is, this book will, like you said, be a resource and can help people turn their lives around. And, you know, if you do want to be an agent of change, if you do want to leave the world a better place, then you have to have character that allows people to listen to you. It can't just be that you have ideas. You have to know how to express the ideas in a way that is persuasive. And part of that is character. So I do hope that people will take advantage of the resource. I've been speaking with Kathy Cook. Notice, Kathy, I... Got it right. Good job. And I and I've always known it's Cook. And here I am. I opened the interview with Kathy Cook. Kathy <laughs> Cook, K O C H, but it's pronounced Cook. Kathy Cook. Are you a good cook, by the way? Uh, of certain things. I'm known for pies and cakes more than anything else. <laughs> okay. Uh, I love P it. PhD. The book is parent differently you have an opportunity to buy this book right after the interview if you'd like and i strongly recommend it uh strongly recommend it and as we say it's a resource it's not just something that you read and you check out the boxes kathy thank you so much for being with us thanks for the invitation i enjoyed talking with you <laughs>